We're going to come to God's word now. So if you've got your Bibles, do you want to open them with me to Mark chapter 2? And we're going to read from verses 15 um, down to 28. So a bit of a longer passage this morning. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have them with him. But the time will come when their bridegroom will be taken away from them. On that day, they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No they pour new wine into new wineskins. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abithar the high priest, he entered the house of God and he ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that as we explore it together now, you will open our hearts and open our minds, that we would hear what you have for us today. Amen. We're continuing our series today on who Jesus is and who we see of him in Mark's gospel. And we've um, we've considered over recent weeks the fact that... At the beginning of his ministry, the response was largely positive, but that as time went on, things became a bit more mixed. And gradually through Mark 2 and Mark 3, we see that not everyone was comfortable with the type of kingdom that Jesus was proclaiming. There was growing opposition to his methods and his message, opposition that would ultimately lead to his death. And last week, we saw the seeds of that opposition in the hearts of the Pharisees as they were outraged at Jesus' claims that he could forgive sins. And here today in our passage, we've got three stories that, that give us more indication of what the nature and the type of the conflict with Jesus was, was about. And here we have conflict, particularly between the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and Jesus and his disciples. And what's important, I think, for us to grasp before we go any further is that the Pharisees were the people in positions of power. They were the ones who had the authority over their community. They thought they had the moral high ground in understanding God's law and in teaching about it. And yet the reality was that over time they had become so legalistic in their behavior and in their interpretation that they'd lost sight of the truth of the God who had given it. And so in each of these three stories, there's a challenge to Jesus, to his interpretation and to his practice. And there's an attempt by the Pharisees to get Jesus and his disciples to conform to what they think should be happening. 
And yet Jesus refuses to be controlled by them. He stands his ground. And in doing so, he illuminates truth about who he is, but also truth about what it is that the Pharisees are teaching. And right in the center of this passage, there is a beautiful description, I think, of new wine being poured into new wineskins. And that description for me hangs together everything that we see before and afterwards. Because what Jesus is doing time and time again as he confronts the hypocrisy and the emptiness of the Pharisees' behavior is revealing that he has come to bring something new, something better, something that can't be contained in the smallness of their old dried skins. And We see that Jesus brings with him an authority that far exceeds that of the Pharisees. So what I want you to do is hold that image of new wine oops, in your heads as we go back to the start of our passage. And we join Jesus and his disciples at dinner with Levi. Because that dinner in itself challenged so much about who the Messiah was going to be and about who his kingdom was for. You see, the Jews were expecting a Messiah, but they were expecting somebody who would be a conquering king, someone who would come and overturn the Roman Empire and free them from all the oppression. And yet, when Jesus arrived on the scene, he was none of the things, really, that they were expecting. And whilst they might have expected that uh, the Messiah would do something about the oppressive tax system, what they didn't expect was that Jesus would call somebody out of that system. He would call a tax collector and make him part of his inner circle. And we know, don't we, that tax collectors were thoroughly disliked. They were seen to have betrayed their family and their community. They were corrupt. They were working for for the Romans, taking more than they needed to, lining their own pockets. And because their job meant that they had to regularly interact with Gentiles who were unclean, they themselves then became unclean by association. And so they were shunned. They were outcast. They weren't allowed in the temple. And they were treated as a bit of a social leper. And so in some ways, we might think that um, the people would be pleased when Levi leaves his booth and joins Jesus. But this just isn't the case. Eating at someone's house was a sign of acceptance and friendship. And the Pharisees could not believe that anybody worth their salt would go and eat with the type of people that Levi and his friends were. So when they see Jesus and his disciples having dinner there, showing that they accept him, showing that they're welcoming to him, they are incensed. And their reactions we see in this passage are cruel and condescending. But Jesus doesn't let them behave like that. He confronts the hypocrisy that he sees and the lie that they are perpetuating by their behavior. Because his kingdom, his message, isn't just for the elite. It isn't just for those that the Pharisees think are worthy. No, it's for those who see that they need God and who are willing to respond to his invitation. And in our passage, Jesus makes it clear. He says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Because it's obvious, isn't it? A saviour should be with those who need saving. And so we've got this stark contrast between Levi and the Pharisees. Levi, who responds to Jesus... And then in his excitement, in his response, he invites all his friends, others, those in his social circle, to come and get to know Jesus too. And then we have the Pharisees who look on and who criticize and who keep others away. They stand at a distance. They look down their nose and they create a barrier between those they think are worthy of God and those who are not. Really, they're saying, you can only get to know God if you belong to my group, if you keep my rules and meet my standards. But by behaving like that, they failed to grasp 
how blind and how self-righteous they were behaving. But they also failed to enable God's mercy and his grace and his healing and forgiveness to be felt and experienced by those who needed it most. And so I wonder, what is the challenge in that for us? Like the Pharisees and the tax collectors, all of us will tend to gravitate to people more like us, people who accept us, people we feel comfortable with. But the Bible challenges that because it isn't always good for us. Jesus noticed those who were in need. He went to those who were shunned, those who were ostracized, those who were on the periphery of society, those others didn't consider worthy. And he accepted their hospitality. He shared himself and his message with them. And so I wonder, if we are honest with ourselves, who are we more like in our behavior? Are we like the Pharisees or are we like Levi? How often do we take opportunities to share the Jesus that we know with the people around us, the people we socialize with, work with, live nearby? How often do we take the time to stop and to notice the needs around us and to see where we have something to offer? Do we speak up for those that society treads down, casts aside? Do we stand up for, against systems that vilify and ostracize others? Do we value those who God values? And having criticized Jesus's interaction with people, then Mark goes on to um, paint a picture of another confrontation, one about things that they do, matters of practice, fasting in this occasion. Once again, they criticize, and once again, Jesus uses this to test them, to test their motives. Now, the Jewish um, world at the time of Jesus was weighed down by laws, some of which had originated from God, but others had been added on over time, intended to help people understand how to outwork the law and to keep themselves pure. But in reality, they had become burdens that distracted and um, distorted the original intent. And fasting was one of those examples. The Old Testament law only actually required the Jews to fast one day a year, Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement. And yet over time... They had um, kind of added to this, and it had become expected practice that you wouldn't just uh, fast on that one day a year, but actually you'd fast twice a week, on a Monday and a Thursday. And so when the Pharisees and the people looked at Jesus and his disciples not doing that, they were confused. In fact, the ang Pharisees were angry. Um, and they got really fixated on this particular practice. But by fixating on the practice, yet again they were missing the point. They turned fasting into a way of judging others rather than recognizing what fasting was meant to be for. You see, an act is never more important than the motivation or the purpose of it. And Jesus reacts to that, but what he doesn't say is that fasting has no place because spiritual disciplines like fasting are good for us. They're meant to draw us closer into a deeper relationship with God. They're not meant to become a block to him. For the Pharisees, their preoccupation was not on the motivation or the reason for the fast, but on whether or not it was being done and whether or not it was being done to their standards. And their focus on the outward, not the inward transformation that fasting should enable, was wrong. And as they judged, effectively, what they were saying was that God's grace only extends to those who behave in a certain way. And Jesus challenges that. Elsewhere, um, we have more of Jesus' teaching on fasting. And Matthew records Jesus saying these words, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. They disfigure their faces for they sh to show others they are fasting. 
Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. Your Father who sees what in secret, done in secret will reward you. Jesus stands against hypocrisy, but he affirms the act of fasting. But he doesn't leave it there. What he does is he takes this opportunity and he makes it something that, um, that teaches and expounds who he is. And he uses the cultural practice of a wedding feast to reveal a little bit more about who he is. He points out that a feast is a celebration. You don't fast when you're feasting. And he says in this that he is the bridegroom. He's saying that something new has come in and through him, something worth celebrating. And as he talks about himself as the bridegroom, what he's doing is taking their minds back to the Old Testament imagery where Yahweh, God, reveals himself as the bridegroom. And here we have another hint of Jesus trying to show them who he is, trying to show them who he is, what he's come to do, and where his authority comes from. But also at the end of that passage, he points forward to what is coming in his death, that time when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and where fasting will be more necessary. And here in this bit of our passage, we have this beautiful double imagery of the new patch and the new wineskins. A new patch will tear old cloth because the old cloth has shrunk New wine will burst old wineskins because those old wineskins have dried up and shrunk. And Jesus is highlighting there's a difference between the old, what has been before, and the new that is to come. And what he's saying is that the man-made structures and the ceremonies and the incomplete picture of the old religious structure that these Pharisees are living by isn't big enough to contain the new wine in all its glory that Jesus is bringing, the new wine that is his gospel and his good news. I don't know whether you remember um, the Maltesers advert that was on TV a while ago, where uh, one lady um, holds up her favourite pair of jeans. And she says, these are my favourite jeans, I love them. And then she pops them, she wants to wear them that night, so she pops them in the dryer And um, unbeknown to her, her sneaky friend picks out Barbie's jeans and swaps them in the dryer so that when she goes to pick up her jeans out of the dryer, she picks up these tiny, tiny things and she says, oh no, I'll never fit into these now. And I think for me, that's a little bit the image that Jesus is painting here. The old skin is too tiny. We're never going to fit in it now because what Jesus is bringing with him, with his gospel, is something so much better. No longer is his kingdom just for the Jews. It's for the Gentiles too. No longer is it just for the the clean. It's for the unclean. It's for the ungodly. It's for the tax collectors and for the sinners. It's for anyone who chooses to recognize Jesus as Savior. It's not only for those who are going to conform to keep the old rules. Jesus has come and he's that new patch, that new wine, not eradicating everything that's gone before, but bringing it to its fullness, fulfilling the law in himself, restoring it to its original best intention taking that all into who he is and then pouring out through himself something radical and new and far better than anything that has gone before. And so Jesus speaks into the dryness and the shrunken version of life that the Pharisees have got themselves caught up in and he offers them something that is expansive and joyous and much more fulfilling. But I wonder where the challenge is for this, for us in this. Are we a bit like the Pharisees, often too busy looking at other people and how they outwork their faith to worry about what should really be at our heart, which is how we are growing in our relationship with God? 
Or are we going through the motions, doing what looks right and good on the outside, but failing to connect with Jesus and live in the fullness of all that he has for us? Because following Jesus shouldn't be a burden. The kingdom of God is designed to bring freedom. And yet, time and time again, we see that humans reduce God's law, make what was meant to be a blessing into a burden. The Sabbath day, meant to be a day of rest, meant to delight um, in God's creation, meant for us to reflect on his provision, to be restored and refreshed. God set aside a day knowing that it was good for us to be in that rhythm of work and rest. And yet the Jews had taken it and they'd, in their worry about wondering what was work and what wasn't, they'd they'd bound it up so tightly that it became a burden. I am... used to work, um, when I was working as a physio, I worked in London with um, a lot of very orthodox Jews. And I saw elements there that connected with me, I suppose, about how really strict adherence to Sabbath rules can damage people. And one particular incident was um, one of my patients was a lovely lady with really severe cerebral palsy um, who needed a lot of help to move. She couldn't get upstairs without the aid of a stair lift. But unfortunately, the strict laws that they um, abided by as a family prohibited them using anything electrical on the Sabbath, unless, of course, things like light switches they turned on before Sabbath began. Um, So every Sabbath, she was stuck downstairs. She was unable to sleep in her bed. And because their house was relatively small, she had to sleep on a sofa that was completely inappropriate for her physical needs. Um, and, and that damaged her, and she got worse. So I had to, <laughs> to work with her to try and undo some of the damage of them adhering to that regulation. Now, obviously, electricity didn't exist when the laws prohibiting work on the Sabbath were instituted. Um, And it's a restriction that rabbis have worked out over time. Um, But it seemed to me that the logic behind employing that particular law in that particular way was damaging to my patient. And it seemed to me that it was very far removed from what God intended when he gave us the Sabbath for rest. And as the Pharisees bring their complaints to Jesus, he brings them back always to scripture, to the original intent. And he asks them to expand their thinking, to recognize the important principles that they are um, distracting and distorting. Once again, the Pharisees, by looking at the Sabbath in the wrong way, have made the wrong focus. They were looking at God's laws, creating burden, rather than looking at God and recognizing that their duty was to love and serve him first and foremost. So throughout this passage, we see that God confronts systems and behaviors and thinking that is wrong. And he speaks truth to those who wield their power in a way that distorts his truth. He speaks truth to those who distract and damage the understanding and actions of others and he challenges it with a divine authority that comes from himself he points to himself as the bridegroom and says look to me don't look to the action and he's revealing that his kingdom is new like new wine more expansive and more wonderful than anything that has gone before And he challenges preconceptions and motivations and understandings and teachings and practices. And so there's a challenge in all of that for us to make sure that we are not operating under wrong thinking and wrong practices. Because we're called to be a people who live and speak by truth. Who aren't afraid to stand up to those who distort or abuse their positions of power and authority. And we're reminded that all the time Jesus prioritized relationship, he demonstrated that every person is welcome to eat at his table. 
And he modeled a need for us to notice those who are vulnerable and oppressed and to be the ones who bridge the gap between those who are accepted and those who are not, to make space at our table just as he makes space at his. And in this passage, we see that Jesus wants us to recognize that actions themselves are empty and distracting where they're not rooted and motivated by God's truth and his love. The Pharisees put the customs of man before the laws of God. We are called to put the love of God and a love for God above all else.